Survivor Series. Um, as you probably noticed, we have M Dining Pizza again. For those of you who were here uh, last week, we tried it out. I got everyone's feedback, and we sent it back up to them, and they did make some changes, um, but I'm happy to continue taking feedback if anyone has any um, on this week's pizza. So I'm um, proud to present our speaker today, Chang Yang, who is Assistant Professor from Biophysics and is going to talk to us about, I think, uh, os oscillators? Oscillators. oscillators. Yes. See, the title wasn't Okay. Thanks, Marcy. And thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you don't mind I show this first, because we are recruiting. I hope students can contact with me if you are interested. Um, so as Marcy said, uh, I'm an assistant professor in biophysics. Um, and my lab is, in general, interested in biological oscillators. And I want to start by showing you an example of what is a biological oscillator and how it functions. So this is a huge embryo from Xenopus. And it's so huge that you can see by your naked eyes. And after fertilization, uh, you see that uh, the, this huge embryo will quickly be chopped into uh, small pieces of cells and in a highly synchronous and clock-like manner. And indeed, we know now that there is a biological clock that controls these processes. And, um, and I'll go through it quickly with you. Uh, how does it work? Um, so in the single cell of the embryo, uh, all the materials are deposited from the mother, and including the maternally deposited mRNA of cyclin B here. So cyclin B will be translated into protein cyclin B that will be bound to cyclin-dependent kinase called CDK1 here. So the binding will make the CDK1 to be activated. But you will see that uh, experimentally, we see CDK1 is not uh, increasing right after cyclin B level increase. And instead, you see a, a, a pretty long uh, time lag. And this is because of the V1 which is uh, kinase, is also a repressor of CDK1. So basically, you imagine um, the V1 will repress CDK1 until cyclin B reaches a very high threshold. And that, uh, and, and that will bring CDK1 to start to turn on. And CDK1, on the other hand, is also a repressor of V1. So this forms a double negative feedback loop. And together with another uh, regulator, the CDC25, which is a uh, phosphatase. And CDC25 and CDK1 forms a double positive feedback loop. So the double positive feedback from CDC25 and double negative feedback from V1 all together makes the CDK1 transition from off to on state in a very sharp manner. So this is actually a bistable switch. It makes the cell enters into mitosis without any premature decision. Okay? And once it enters, it will not exit. So uh, that's the beauty of these two uh, feedback loops. Now, when the CDK1 turns on, it will drive the cell into mitosis. That's when the, another protein complex, is called anaphase promoting complex, being turned on. And this complex is an E3 ubiquitin ligase that targets cyclin B for degradation, and therefore to reset CDK1 back to off state. So that completes the first cell cycle. And eventually, you will imagine it continuously, because this is a cell autonomous oscillator. It will drive the system in a self-sustained manner. OK, so this is for cell cycle. In fact, there are many, many oscillators you can imagine of. Um, and these are the oscillators that play an important role in a lot of cellular and developmental processes, and including uh, the neuron spikes that you, are, you probably are familiar with, the heartbeat. Um, and in the vertebrates, there is a segmentation clock that also drives the periodic formation of somites. And circadian clock, uh, where Almost all the organisms on Earth have it uh, because it will drive our internal clock to match the day-night cycles. Okay. So they are, they, they are actually very different because some are formed by protein networks, some are by genetic regulations. 
And if you align them uh, based on their periods, you can see that their periods also span orders of magnitude. So they're very diversified. But I'm a physicist by training. Uh, so one intuitive question uh, interesting to, to me is, uh, is there any fundamental design principle that maybe exists to be shared among all these similarly very different clocks? And in addition, uh, we could uh, think about that multiple clocks may co-regulate the same process. So another question that we are interested in now in the lab is, uh, how do different clocks couple together to form, say, spatial temporal patterns uh, that you will for example, C in the somite formation. Um, so I will uh, specifically talk about these two questions today. And for the first question, um, to find out the, the fundamental design principles, we may first think about what are the fundamental features that may be shared among the clocks. So first of all, it must be tunable. So by tunable, it means uh, it can uh, be, it, it will see the environmental cues and will adjust to environmental cue, such as the light, temperature, and condition for any oscillators. But as a constant condition, it must be robust. So these are, so the tunability and the robustness are the two um, basic functions that all the biological clocks should have. So now the question is, can we find fundamental design principles that uh, will yield these functions? So to find that, it's often to be very challenging because the typical pathway for the oscillator, like the cell cycle, it's very complicated. You can find hundreds of molecules involved in a certain um, oscillator. So it will be very hard for us to gain any, um, say, fundamental or basic insight out of it if we directly look at all the molecular details. So instead, we use um, this method. Uh, it's, it's in the systems biology and synthetic biology. Let's go to the first. Um, so we ask the question, can we find out what is required if we are going to build an oscillator ourselves? And what is the minimum design for an oscillator? And that question actually being asked back in 1965. This is a classical Goodwin oscillator. I mean, at the time, there is no experimental tools being able to build it. <coughs> but we can still computationally predict whether we can build such an oscillator. So in a Goodwin oscillator, there is a gene, say, A, that can transcribe into mRNA called B. And the B mRNA will translate into protein C. Now, if you imagine the C is uh, the repressor of the gene A itself, that will form a single negative feedback loop. Okay. So the intermediate step B here is also important because that will uh, help this single negative feedback loop to generate self-sustained oscillations. Otherwise, um, you won't have enough time delay. So you would imagine the system will simply damp into a stable steady state. So this is all computational. Now, until 2000, uh, there is a famous work done by Michael Allos and Stan Leibler. Uh, they actually form such a negative feedback loop in the bacterial E. coli. So what they do is they put three negative genes that repress each other, and they call it as repress later. Now, they clone that into the E. coli. They can see the E. coli can do self-sustained oscillations. Um, and three years later, uh, another design is done by a group, actually Alexander and Infa's group um, on, on our own campus here. Uh, so they form, uh, in addition to the negative feedback, they form another positive feedback that coupled together with this negative feedback. And what's interesting about this design is if we do a survey of all the natural oscillators we know, Almost all of them have this positive plus negative feedback topology. So it means that this topology actually is important. It's ev evolutionary conserved. Um, 
And, but the question is this. So if we know that the single negative feedback is sufficient, sufficient to generate self-sustained oscillation, why do we need the positive feedback here? Right. So in 2008, um, a computational study done by Jim Farrell's group, um, they tried to answer this question by compare, uh, comparing three different topologies. So the first is a repressilator. And the second is a repressilator adding additional positive feedback. And the third is a repressilator adding additional self-negative feedback. And they compare their performance of robustness by looking at uh, doing a parameter scan and score the robustness by the percentage of the parameter sets that support oscillations for a certain topology. Okay. And what they found here, as you, you will see at different bars here, so uh, if it's just a repressilator, you will see the score is pretty low. Okay. And if you add a self-positive feedback for either a, a, a weak self-positive or a strong self-positive, you will have significant increase of robustness. But that increase is not seen if you add a self-negative feedback. So their conclusion is that the self-positive feedback can make the oscillator more robust. And, and another point is more tunable, which I do not mention here because we are now focusing on robustness. Okay. Um, but a more recent study seems to have a different um, result. So in this study, uh, they built activator bacterial and the repressor bacterial, uh, which is denoted as uh, the cyan and yellow here. Okay, and then they interact together with quorum sensing so that they can form an oscillator at the population level. And what they found is if they add another self-negative feedback, this oscillator indeed increases the robustness. So we think that the discrepancy seems to come from the fact that both of the studies have only chosen a subset of the networks to look at. But in reality, we should think about different designs can achieve the same function, even though some designs might be more efficient than the others. Okay. Um, so in order to find out the fundamental principles, we have to look at the whole, key, the complete picture. Okay. So. Indeed, this idea uh, is also supported by other computational studies. Uh, so these are the four examples to look at the different functions. So for example, for the perfect adaptation system, you can either have a buffer node from through B, or you can have an incoherent feedforward loop. Both of them can achieve the perfect adaptation. Right. So that motivates us for our study. So here, instead of looking at just the one or two oscillators, we're looking at all possible oscillators with two or three nodes. Right. So in total, we can have 3,325 topologies. And for each topology, we do a parameter scan, and we detect the self-sustained oscillatory behavior. Right. And then we map it to a function space. So in this case, we are specifically looking at robustness, which we use a Q value, which is uh, a standard way to score for robustness in the field. And it's defined as the number of parameter sets that support oscillations. Okay. So for example, if the topology 1 has a larger volume in the parameter space than topology 2, we say topology 1 is more robust than topology 2. So with this algorithm, we could generate a whole uh, atlas of all possible oscillators. And here we identified 1,420 clock topologies. So we arrange it based on their complexity. So in this case, because we only focus on two node and three node networks, so the number of the edges can be a way to, um, to basically quantify the complexity of this network. So the edge can range from 3 all the way up to 9. 
as a total number of the edges. Now, within each row, we arrange the clock topologies based on their robustness in a decreasing order. So the color bar here is a Q value in a log scale. As you can see here, uh, you do see that the robustness seems to span orders of magnitude. So that, that means, yes, we have all these different designs can do oscillations. But some designs apparently are better than others in terms of the robustness. Um, so at the bottom of the whole complete, uh, the whole atlas here are the eight cores. So the cores are the minimum designs, meaning that if you remove any node or any edge, it will just stop the ability for oscillations. And what's interesting here is out of the eight cores, the top three most robust cores are actually the ones that I introduced that actually are found in natural and synthetic system. And these are repressor, positive plus negative feedback loop, and the Goodwin oscillator. Okay. Um, but there is one thing that is also interesting and also puzzling is, so if you look at it, core two and core six here, they're both positive plus negative feedback loops. The only difference is that for core two, the self-positive adds to uh, the activator B. And for core six, the self-positive adds to the repressor A. So this is a very subtle difference. But this subtle difference resulting uh, on the Q value change by a factor of 45. So that means they are very different performance. And what's more interesting is that in natural system, only core two is found, but not core six. All right. So I will uh, go back to this later and trying to explain why um, we have this different performance. Um, but other pairs we do see as well uh, the difference like core five and core seven, core four and core eight. Okay. So we think there are some local structures that are really important. Um, but before we get to that, um, let's go back to the original question. So what are the major uh, cause or uh, the reasons for we to see a large um, range of the robustness for all the possible oscillator designs? So to find that out, um, we, we first look at whether the core topologies play an important role. So we are grouping all the topologies based on their core composition. So here now, uh, we are actually going to compare the robustness of topologies with different complexity. So it's not fair to compare this um, using just uh, the Q value. Okay. So instead, uh, we have a uh, uh, alternative uh, uh, definition for the robustness. So here, we're using the R value, which is the uh, uh, percentile rank of the Q value among the topologies with the same complexity. Okay. So now it means if you have a higher R value, that means less robust, and lower is more robust. Okay. So you see that um, if the group of the topologies as none of the three core uh, robust core topologies is actually the least robust on average. Now, if you have uh, more and more robust cores, you will have more robust topologies for that group. Okay, so that means uh, the core topologies play some important roles, but that cannot explain this. Okay. So, for example, within this same group, okay, with, within this group, all the topologies have the same core composition, but they still span a large range okay, of their robustness. So that means we must miss something. Okay? The core is important, but there are some peripheral modifications that are not required for oscillations, but may be important for robustness of the oscillations. So we would like to find it out. Right? So to find that out, uh, we do a pairwise comparison for all the neighbors that we find in the 
atlas. So by neighbors, that means any two pairs that only have one edge difference. Okay. And for the two topologies out of the pair, we decompose each topology into a two edge motif. All right. And then we calculate the difference of the two edge motifs as an input. And we also calculate the rank difference as an output. And then we use statistics tools to find out which are the most significant input or the two edge uh, motifs that play the important role in changing the robustness, which is the output. Okay. So on the left here is the lasso. It's a linear regression technique. Um, and we use that and also use a partial rank correlation coefficient just as a comparison. So for both of them, it seems to identify the same group. Okay. So the top group here are the nodes that are receiving coherent inputs. And this group seems to improve, uh, decrease the robustness of the oscillations. And the bottom group here is uh, for the nodes that are receiving um, the incoherent inputs. And this group seems to increase the robustness. All right. So we identify these uh, motifs. And we want to find out whether these motifs indeed play an important role in changing the robustness of the whole network that it embeds in. Okay. So what we do here is Again, we group all the topologies from the atlas. And based on the number of the nodes with either coherent inputs or co incoherent inputs. And what we found is that, uh, that the more incoherent inputs, the less coherent inputs, the more robust they are, which is the top right corner here. That's the most robust networks. And so that supports the idea that, uh, yes, the incoherent and the coherent inputs are local structures, but they play an important role in changing the global behavior of the network. And what's more interesting is that their effects are additive. Define so, coherent and incoherent force. Uh, the definition of the incoherent and the coherent. So yes, so the definition would be uh, we are looking at all the two edge motifs, okay? And this two edge, uh, meaning that there is a node, and then there is two regulations. If we have this node have two input regulation, and one is positive, another is negative, or one is positive, another is self-negative, or one is negative, another is self-positive. So they have the opposite sign of the regulation to the same node. Then we call it as an incoherent input motif. And the opposite would be the coherent. So if one uh, node they just has one input, then there's no coherent or incoherent. So yes. So you're asking about the question uh, whether we can identify a one uh, edge motif. No, it's still two edge, right? Like the uh, second one on the first line, so it has just one input, right. but so, it's two-edge. Yeah, so this two-edge, so I do not eliminate the possible of the two outputs, or one input, or one output. So these are all belonging to the two-edge motifs. Yeah, so, so is this coherent or incoherent? This one is not coherent, not incoherent, because they don't have two input regulations. So this is uh, simply one out of uh, 28 uh, two edge motifs. And these, um, in our analysis, does not play a significant role in changing the robustness of the oscillator. OK, any other questions? All right, so now we have this. and. One possible explanation might be this. So if we are comparing, say, a node with an input regulation, and then a node with coherent input, or a node with incoherent input, and we calculate for their knock lines, 
which is a steady state solution uh, for this ODE. And we found that only the, the incoherent input seems to have the larger uh, increased range of the knock line comparing to the single input, while the coherent input seems to decrease the range. And we think that by increasing the possible uh, steady state solutions for this, that will also increase the chance for other null clients to choose parameters in order to intercept within the null client to generate oscillations. So therefore, it will increase the robustness of the oscillator of the system. So that's, that's a, some intuitive explanation. And it also uh, answers the question that I asked at the beginning. So to compare the core 2 and the core 6, the difference is this. So for core 2, uh, when you add the self positive to the activator of this system, it actually forms an incoherent input. But for core 6, it forms a coherent input. Okay. So then we are going to do a survey for the actual system. So this is the all natural systems that we found from literature. And it seems that the incoherent input motif indeed enrich uh, in these natural oscillators. And it also enrich uh, in the older synthetic oscillators that we know so far in the literature. Okay. So this is a computational study. To conclude for this part, uh, we first show that the topology plays an important role uh, in determining certain biological function. And specifically, we find that incoherent inputs um, can be a motif that increase the oscillator robustness. And actually, we also do the analysis, which I didn't show here, is the positive feedback increase the tunability of the oscillator. So now, all, all of these are computational studies. The next question for us is, can we design experiments to test our computational predictions? The ideal system would be the cell cycle. As I introduced at the beginning, we know that the CDC25 form a double positive feedback, and V1 forms a double negative feedback. And indeed, these two also forms the incoherent input with the APC regulation and the coherent input with the APC regulation. So this would be the ideal system for us to test um, our computational prediction because we can design some experiment uh, with either uh, recombinant protein or the drugs to, uh, to compromise the double positive or double negative feedback, and then to score for the biological oscillator behavior. And so to do that, um, so we first want to find out uh, whether this oscillator is designed to be robust against a certain noise. So now, what is the most, uh, like, the most significant noise resource for this system? And what we think is uh, uh, possibly from the MRA of cycling B, because the MRA of cycling B is an input of the clock. So if you have more MRAs, you imagine the synthesis rate will be higher and um, the clock speed will be higher. And if you have a low amount of MRA, the clock will be slowing down. Okay. So that's a very effective input knob. Uh, on the other hand, for the early embryo development, the MRA can only be deposited from the mother. Because at this time, there is no gene transcription yet. So this maternally deposited MRA will have to be distributed into all the cells while it's a dividing. And in the bacterial um, community, it's well known that um, the partition arrows can generate some significant noise source to change um, some time series. Um, and so in our system, we think that the MRA will have the partition noise during each cell division and eventually will affect well, um, this oscillatory behavior. So to study that, uh, it's actually not very efficient to study that in the live embryos. Because as you see from the video that I just played, um, 
so it's it's not efficient to generate such a video and basically just uh, one whole video at a time and what's more um, important is that um, we have to take into account of the embryo to embryo variability when we do this study which adds more complexity so instead what our idea is to um, basically collect all the embryos, break them down, take only the cytosol part. Well, the cytosol part will include all the essential clock players. And then we encapsulate that in the microfluidic chamber that's filled with oil. And that allows us to generate this oil droplet at different sizes. And inside will be the oscillators. And we call it as artificial cells because we can actually generate not only just the oscillator itself, like CDK1 APC oscillator, we can also reconstitute all the mitotic events downstream, such as the chromosome condensation, the nuclear envelope breakdown, and possibly spindle formations. Okay. So they can perform all the mitotic functions as what cells do, but outside of the cells. And this is just one example to show about the nuclear envelope breakdown. So what we do is we put a reporter. This is a nuclear localization signal filled with a green fluorescent protein. All right. And at the bottom here, I show you a, a, a one example. So for this specific artificial cell, it can oscillate. Um, sorry about that. Oh, the, um, is that good? OK, good. Uh, all right, so for this time trace, uh, you see that when the cells or artificial cells uh, is in interface, you will have the nuclear localization signal or inputting it into the nuclei that has been reconstituted. So you will see the green dots here. Now, when the cells enter into mitosis, there will be nuclear envelope breakdown. So you will see all the GFPs diffusing outside. So you will see a, a uniform um, background. OK. So and then we use that to score for the oscillations. And so this system um, not only can allow us to answer questions such as the robustness of the oscillator, we can also answer some other questions. So for example, um, I didn't mention at the beginning, so for the early embryo development, um, especially as an early cell division part, uh, the cell at the beginning is large. Um, and then it goes through multiple cell cycles. And these cell cycles are different than somatic cell cycles. So there are no cell growth. Okay. So uh, it simply oscillates between the DNA synthesis phase and the mitosis without any gap phases like G1 and G2. So you will see a dramatic reduction of the cell sizes while the cell is dividing. And it's going for zebrafish embryo, going all the way from 100 micrometer uh, to tens of micrometer. So this would be a, a pretty large impact for cell cycles or other, um, other events. So we would like to use this system to study how cell size is affecting the cell cycles. And another uh, interesting thing is um, so we are interested in understanding whether the cell cycle will respond to some kind of force, mechanical force, either applied outside or by unbalancing the spindles. Right. So we can also use the, um, this artificial cell system. And uh, we are collaborating with uh, Alan Liu from Mechanical Engineering Lab uh, to study for this. And so, so far we have only discussed about um, just a single oscillator and how it is designed and how it functions. Um, but we know that 
um, even for single cells, there are multiple oscillators that can run in parallel. And these oscillators may not run independently. They could couple together. And in fact, there is evidence uh, for our previous studies that even in the single cell organism like cyanide bacteria, uh, we will have um, the circadian oscillator that cross talk with the cell division cycles through some molecular pathway. And so what we are interested in now is to look at how the, the oscillators are coupled together in a multicellular organism. And that could generate um, like very complicated patterns. And so there are many computational studies before to understand this process. It, there is a term called self-organization. So that means there are some uh, certain microscopic behaviors which can be random or unpredictable. But they can have certain rules to interact to generate a macroscopic behavior or collective behavior that is highly predictable. Okay. But there is no study yet, or there is a study, but less than the computational study in terms of the experimental um, evidence for this. So what we are trying to do is to look at the process of the somatogenesis. So you will see that there is a stripe pattern that is forming during this process. And the interesting thing is uh, there are two oscillators that co-regulate this process. Uh, one is a segmentation clock, uh, which is also inside each single cell that can oscillate with the period that coincident with the somat forming, which is about 30 minutes um, per cycle for zebrafish. And there is also a mitotic oscillator, which controls the proliferation during the process. And there is a clock and wavefront model, which is a, a classical model to describe the system. And in this system, uh, there is the, um, so there is anterior and the posterior for the zebrafish. Um, and so each single cell of this region will have both cell cycles and segmentation clock. And they oscillate um, based on the cell, um, um, cell autonomous behavior of the circuit. And what this uh, model says is uh, there is global signaling uh, gradients, such as the FGF, wind signaling, and RA signaling, that will generate a queue globally. Uh, it's called a wavefront. So when the cells sense the queue, they start to differentiate into the muscle cells. And that's where the somat is generating. Okay. So this model is very popular, but it's also uh, overly simplified, um, as we found um, for the recent studies, because they don't really take into account of um, the, sing the behavior at the single cell level. So in the uh, recent study um, in development of cell, they look at the they group all the dividing cells. And they found that uh, the dividing cells are not uniformly distributed along the segmentation clock phase. And it seems that most of the dividing cells are um, concentrated at the trough phase of the segmentation clock. So that indicates there might be some interactions between these clocks at the single cell level. Okay. So that motivate us to do this study. So here, we would like to quantify whether there is a coupling between the segmentation clock and the cell cycle. And we use two fluorescence reporters. And the left here is the Fuchi cell cycle reporter. So for um, well, some of you might not be familiar with these uh, reporters, these are the two substrates of the APC that can be degraded at different cell cycle phase. And they are attached to different colored um, fluorescence protein. So you would imagine that uh, the cell will change color throughout the cell cycle phase. And that also is a convenient way to allow us to quantify what is the cell cycle phase for that specific cell. And on the right here, 
uh, is the uh, HER1, which is the central regulator for segmentation clock. And that fuses with uh, Venus, which is a yellow fluorescence protein, and uh, to basically quantify for the segmentation clock. And if we cross the two fish lines together, we can get the embryos that each single cell contains both the uh, reporters. And that will allow us to simultaneously track uh, these two oscillators within the single cell. And I'll go briefly, uh, we can set up some models uh, to basically take into account the coupling of the two oscillators within the cell by a defined coupling function and also the coupling among the neighboring cells through, say, notch delta signaling uh, by this term here. And experimentally, uh, we could follow these oscillators. And this is not, this is very preliminary um, data. I mean, uh, so in order to track each single cell, we have to do a 3D segmentation and a tracking. And so basically, this is to show that we can use the membrane and the nuclear labeling to do a segmentation and a tracking. OK. So to summarize for today's talk, uh, I want to throw in this slide. So basically, in our lab, um, we're trying to combine the artificial cell system and also the live embryos to basically complement each other uh, to give us a, a good experimental platform. And so we use the quantitative experiments, um, mostly centered on the fluorescence microscopy and microfluidics, and together with mathematical modeling. And we think that both are important, um, very important uh, 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 resources for us to understand the biological questions. And with that, I want to uh, thank everyone in the lab, especially here and agenda, uh, our two talented graduate students. Uh, so most of the work that I present today are done by these two students. And thanks for my collaborators and the support. Um, and I want to show this slide again. And I'm happy to take any questions. The robustness was quantified by two variables. Mm -hmm. How was it operated? How, why is uh, quantified by Q value for robustness? Um, so the Q value uh, is the definition is a number of the parameters in the whole parameter space that can generate a certain biological function that you are interested in. In our case, it's oscillation behavior. So it doesn't tell us if there's a perturbation to a system, how strong, how easily it will go back into its own state. So there are different ways to quantify um, for robustness. And Q value, as what I said, is a, a convenient and also popular way in the field to quantify. And that way is to basically tell us if I vary the parameter, say for certain parameters such as the EC50 or HAL coefficient, and if I vary large, can I disturb the system so that the system will not be able to oscillate if I vary a lot of certain parameter? Now, another way is to be more, as you mentioned about the fluctuation, is more um, the, uh, a, a, a way to quantify how this system is sensitive to the fluctuation, such as um, certain, we can say parameters, or we can say certain uh, variables. And so, so that's that's different way. Um, so in our study, we are using the, um, the Q value to quantify it. Yes. In those um, <coughs> triangular shaped oscillators, right. you have three nodes and edges. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about simulating uh, mm -hmm. many runs? Yeah. Can that be just soft and closed form in differential equations? Sets of differential equations. Uh, so you mean what is the uh, specific uh, equations? For the cycling conditions, can that be soft? Mm -hmm. as just a phase diagram in closed form. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, 
series <coughs> of frequency equation yeah, yeah. without running simulation. Oh, develop a series. So you are talking about the analytical solutions and then to do a bifurcation, for example. Yeah, we have thought about this. This actually turns out to be very challenging for our study because we are, um, we don't, uh, so in our uh, system, like for the simplest case, um, like say three edge network, uh, and each edge could have uh, more than four um, parameters. So we end up with a, a high, very high dimension um, space, like a parameter space. So to do the bifurcation, it's, it's very challenging. Um, and so because our oscillators also have like a nine, all the way to nine edges, it's, it's even larger. So I have to say um, we are going to the numerical um, solution is because of uh, the limitation. And then later on, when you have more complex models, mm -hmm. many more nodes and edges, right. are there ways to do lower level programming, even at the chip level, to make this more efficient? Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, we engineered GFPs to compute large populations of oscillators. Uh, are you talking about the the, the later part? The later part the is a coupling of different oscillators. Right. Yeah. In, in okay, so about the experimental part, right? For in all parts. In, in the first a single oscillator, right. it has more than three components. Yes. Instead of triangle, let's say you have eight nodes. Okay, so you are talking about the higher nodes of then mm -hmm. if you want to put your exhaustive library of yeah. possible oscillators into higher and higher uh, complexity, even computing power to do it, I guess. Yeah, I think we will run out of the computing power. So um, so you are you have some suggestions no. about Reducing the. I know people who mm -hmm. program chips for specialized oh. uh, applications to make it go faster. That would be very interesting. But My other question is that, um, when you are talking about mm -hmm. coupling between oscillators right. in this intercellular sense, we also need occasionally the unrobust uh, oscillator to be compliant followers to make the system work more robust. Mm. So, uh, such as with your, your three wheels coupled right. together, mm -hmm. if all three are inherently robust, they may actually clash on their oh, okay. edges. So that's uh, yeah. So in in fact, um, we so there is a <clears throat> one thing that this is purely out of uh, this is out of no like um, any support. It's just a by imagining. So we know that circadian clock in not only cyanobacteria, but in many other organisms, it sits at the top. So it's like a master. And cell cycle used to be a slaver of this master driver and in many, many cases. And so we think it depends on the clock. And this interaction is a one directional interaction, meaning that the circadian clock can regulate cell cycle, but cell cycle cannot regulate circadian clock. So it might be coming from the property of the clocks themselves. So circadian clock, we know, is temperature compensative. It's very, very robust to temperature. And our cell cycles, on the other hand, is very sensitive to temperature. So at high temperature, you run faster, and low temperature, you run slower. And other, um, it's, it's also more tunable by other um, other cues. So we think, back to your question, if all of them are very robust, they may not be a good coordinated oscillators. So only if, say, one is more robust than the others, there might be some kind of crosstalk. Right. So, so we are miserable during mm -hmm. adjustment to jet lag yeah. because this follower clock Right. That's a, to make 
every cell in your body to be yeah. compliant just for those two days, mm -hmm. adjust to the time zone. It's right. much better, right? Mm -hmm. That's one way to. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's actually a, a good way uh, to think about it because yeah, we we need to have uh, like three say three uh, consecutive like day night cycles in order to adjust all our body clocks like in order to right. right. Some people need more. To find a way to make them compliant, it might be good for a uh, heart attack or for epilepsy mm -hmm. or for jet yeah, lag. Yeah, that's yeah, very interesting way to think about it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Bye. So the whole class is fucking helping me.